Professor Lionel Tarashenko. Now, Lionel is a world leading expert in the application of signal processing and machine learning in healthcare and has a strong track record in translation to clinical medicine. He's received many accolades and awards, both for his research and for his considerable achievements in technology translation. Lionel's been an academic in the department since April 1988, and he was elected to the Chair of Electrical Engineering in 1997. He played a leading role in the establishment of the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, where he was also director, before later becoming head of Department of Engineering Science, which he, a post which he held until last year. Since then, he's been appointed as the president of Oxford's newest college, Reuben College, uh, while remaining a senior research fellow in the department. And I'm very pleased to um, hand over to uh, Lionel now, who will be talking about patient monitoring research in the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, or if you're in a different time zone, good morning or good evening. Um, delighted to be here. Um, now let me share my screen in turn. Yes, can everybody you. see the screen? Yes, we can see it now, Lionel. Okay. Apologies for a um, temporary failure of um, PowerPoint. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, the one thing I would say about being president of this new college is when I was asked by the Vice Chancellor to take this on, I only had one condition, which was to um, be able to do that 60% of my time and to carry on research and innovation the other 40%. And that's been extremely helpful in the last six months because um, being um, having a lab which is focused on patient monitoring, uh, we obviously became very busy in February, March, and I was able to devote uh, plenty of time to work with my research team to work on a number of projects um, to help uh, with monitoring patients and individuals in the COVID-19 pandemic. I realize we're running a bit late, so we don't have time to ask all the questions. So I'm happy, you see my email here at the bottom. I'm happy for you to uh, send me questions by email if we don't have time to do them all in the chat. So um, what I'm gonna be talking about is five projects very quickly. I'm not gonna have time to go into detail because of the time available. And I would imagine some of these will appeal to different people and that's why I'm happy to take further questions. So there's a summary of the projects um, and I'm going to put that summary screen um, every time I talk about one, two, three, four, five. And the reason we were able to really have an impact on monitoring patients during the pandemic was because of the work we'd been doing in the IBME, developing technology and apps for patient monitoring for the past decade. So the first one is the remote management of high-risk pregnant women. The idea, of course, as I'm sure, is to avoid people going into hospital. Now, if you developed high blood pressure um, during pregnancy, you have danger of developing then preeclampsia um, and subsequent to that eclampsia, and that can be fatal. And the way women were managed pre-pandemic was to um, be checked in the clinic every two weeks, um, and then to, to go home and be told uh, to um, take whatever steps they needed to take at that point. Obviously, um, having women come in every two weeks or even every four weeks is not the right thing to do during a pandemic. Um, if you know about the complications of trying to get into a hospital during a pandemic, I had a granddaughter bald, uh, born in, at the end of April, um, and so I know some of those complications. And so what happened is we just by huge serendipity finished a trial um, of this blood pressure management tool called BPM Health to help uh, expected mothers self-monitor their blood pressure, communicate remotely with the healthcare team managing them and receiving reminders on when to take readings and also any advice depending on the results submitted. So what we did in record time, normally to transfer technology from the university to one of the companies uh, that we work with, in my case, Sensign Health here, because uh, I'm part-time R&D director at Sensign Health as well. Uh, instead of this taking about six months, which is what it normally takes, we did it in about a week. So the app that you can see on your right became available 
and we now have several hundred women using this technology. It is approved nationally um, for monitoring your blood pressure if you are at risk of developing high pressure during pregnancy. So the first app was keeping people away from hospital that we don't need to have in hospital, um, if at all. The second one was similar to Zoe, you may have heard about, which is self-monitoring at home. Uh, we did not only symptoms, but also vital signs. Um, but the one thing that we have done above and beyond what Zoe, which is a very good app developed by King's College, uh, have done is to link the data with a healthcare professional. And that's become very important because we're now working with care homes, as I will explain in my next slide. So again, we did this work with Sensign Health um, using a digital app where patients and carers, and that's very important, for example, in care homes, or if you have an elderly relative not able to use the internet, you can do this on their behalf. And there's a whole lot, of course, of information governance around this, which uh, Sensign Health sorted out, and allows either the patients um, or their carers to enter vital signs and symptoms every day. Very simple, it's a web app, so, um, and indeed any of you, if you want to have a look at it, uh, you can see the address here uh, of the web page, uh, and it's very simple to register if you're interested to do so. Now, the features that we have in this app, you can see the front screen on the right, symptom recording, vital sign recording, including levels of oxygen in your blood, oxygen saturation, which is very important. As I mentioned, we can do this for other people. Um, we like to know about existing health conditions and medications. Uh, the COVID-19 status, which you might have got through a test um, with Professor Shui's technology, uh, can be entered. And you can see your history over the past few days, and most importantly, share it with a healthcare professional remotely. Now, the advantage of what we did is that we did it with a Microsoft Health Bot, which means that we can create or change the questions extremely quickly. And that has allowed us to um, develop a version of the app for clinical trials in care homes. So I'm sure you've read all about the clinical trials done in hospital um, by an Oxford team led by Martin Landry and Peter Holby, which has discovered that dexamethasone <coughs> and the hydrocortisone, so uh, steroids, uh, can really help decrease mortality for patients in hospital. What a lot of other pharmaceutical companies are also working on are clinical trials before you get to hospital. And a lot of those are now being done in care homes because they're trials in the community. And of course, because uh, care home part, um, residents tend to be elderly, there's a greater proportion of people infected in care homes than in the general population. So we have two clinical trials in care homes about to start now, sponsored by the Wellcome Trust and Cancer Research UK, of treatments which are being repurposed for people who become infected with um, the virus and we hope to keep out of hospital. Now, some of you will know um, that I've been working with my spin out company, OxyHealth, uh, for the last decade or so on video camera technology. Um, very briefly, the idea now is to use a video camera and to film an area of skin, here the face, and there are what are called micro blushes, tiny changes in color during the cardiac cycle. These are shown amplified, and but they can be picked up with an RGB camera from a phone. You can see there the, uh, the red, the green, and the blue. And those changes in color can be picked up as indeed the changes of volume. And in fact, there's also periodic head motion and the cardiac frequency. And all of that can be uh, picked up to pick up this at the bottom. You can see here um, this um, signal, um, which is uh, with a region of interest of 100 by 100. And if you can't in times, uh, the peaks and troughs are at the frequency of the heartbeat. If you have a much smaller region of interest on the skin, at the top here, it gives you the breathing frequency here, three and a half breaths in 20 seconds. If you multiply by three, it gives you a breathing rate of about 10 to 11, whereas the heart rate down here is of the order of 60 beats per minute. Now, this is an ideal signal. It's much more difficult to make this a robust process. But that's what we've been doing with the camera ox uh, company, um, 
Oxy Health, which turns cameras into health monitors. Um, you can see here a non-patient volunteer. Uh, this is actually the picture seen by the camera and it's extracted um, the heart rate of 69 and a breathing rate of 20. And this together was installed in a primary care COVID hub in East Oxford, in Cali, together with a pulse oximeter to um, measure the oxygen saturation. And this is the way that they screen patients in that COVID hub uh, for COVID before deciding whether or not to admit them to hospital. So um, the main hospital project I will now describe in the next five minutes or so, um, which is um, a project using wearables of monitoring patients on COVID wards. So these are isolation wards in the hospitals. Uh, we had been developing for the past two years a virtual high dependency unit uh, in a collaboration between engineers from my research group, the biomedical signal processing and machine learning group, and clinicians from our local hospital. And the idea was that um, high risk patients could be monitored and managed on a general ward using wearables and smart alerting algorithms. So even if they were high risk, they could be on the general ward because we'd give them wearables and monitor them um, on the ward. And this involves putting a chest patch, which you can see here, and a wrist-worn pulse oximeter. There's a finger probe, then there's a kind of watch strap that you uh, wear, uh, and that gives you the oxygen saturation. The chest patch gives you breathing rate and uh, heart rate, and they're linked via Bluetooth to an Android tablet, um, which is by the bedside and of ambulatory patients on the general wards. And this allowed us to uh, monitor high-risk patients on the general ward. We were able to adapt it very quickly for COVID in about a month. We started at the end of February 2020. So these were deployed on the isolation ward of the John Radcliffe Hospital. It's important uh, to allow patients to mobilize, is uh, the clinical term used, to allow, to allow them to be ambulatory, because it's very important a respiratory disease um, when you should really be walking around to help uh, with your treatment and so you maintain the monitoring whilst patients are ambulatory and the key thing as well of course it meant that uh, the nurses on the other side of the wall so outside the isolation ward could come in far less often and therefore decrease their viral load and be less likely both to get COVID or if they got it to get it not as seriously as though who had a high viral load and we went live with this on the day that um, uh, the Prime Minister declared a lockdown in his country and it became the normal practice for the 60 patients that we found in the in, um, isolation ward at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And here's the um, a, uh, Android tablet showing the electrocardiogram and um, next to it um, the heart rate. Patient may be slightly anxious, 99 beats per minute. Um, oxygen saturation coming from the wrist-worn pulse oximeter and here the signal from the wrist-worn oximeter, the light being shown through the finger um, uh, oscillating at the, at the cardiac frequency but also being able to pick up a breathing signal uh, give you a breath a breathing rate of 11 breaths per minute. Um, what the nurses on the other side of the wall outside the isolation room had because the idea is to go from the Android tablet um, to the other side of the wall where the nurses are and display, as you can see here, uh, on the nursing workstation, um, the data using the hospital Wi-Fi. So there's a dashboard allowing the physiological status of the patients to be tracked in real time. And what this allowed us to do was to monitor as many as 11, 12 patients simultaneously on the COVID ward. We made it really easy to use by the nursing staff. Um, and what they were really pleased about, as I said, they reduced the exposure to infected patients. Doctors were able to see the trends um, from another screen that we had on the dashboard, and the system is continuing to be used and is now being scaled up for a possible second wave. So in the final very few minutes, I just want to talk very quickly about what we've learned about the trajectory of the COVID-19 disease. Once patients are in hospital, um, including being monitored by the technology I just described to you. So we analyzed the electronic patient record of about 500 adult patients with COVID 
and we compared it with the data from a cohort of patients with the nearest disease, which is viral pneumonia pre-pandemic. And what you can see is both the top plots. On the left, you have the COVID-19 patients. On the right, you have the viral pneumonia patients. And what you, in green, you have the patients who um, were discharged from the hospital fine. Um, and everything is done backwards. Naught is the day from the uh, the day they discharge, and you're going negative along the time axis here to seven days before discharge. And you can see that the oxygen saturation dropping very fast, even though the inspired oxygen to, uh, which they're given, um, uh, as I said, this is outside the intensive care unit, um, goes up almost to 80% in some cases compared with room air, which is 21% oxygen, as you know. And this is much greater than what happens to viral pneumonia patients. So we know that um, COVID-19 is a, a disease that is very fast, rapidly worsening respiratory failure, much more rapidly than with viral pneumonia. And based on this, uh, another word that we're doing at the time, um, we uh, tuned up the early warning score that is used in hospitals and adapted for COVID-19 patients because paradoxically, most of the other vital signs are completely normal um, when a patient suffers from COVID-19. It is only really the vital signs to do with the respiratory system. And finally, working with um, Sensei and Health again uh, to help triage patients when they arrive in the hospital, we collected data in the emergency department, again from the electronic patient record, uh, or the emergency room as it would be known as in the US. So uh, their age, their sex, their ethnicity, their vital signs, um, which are the heart rate, breathing rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, blood pressure, and then lab values as well. And within the fi first five hours, you get all this information. And from that, we trained machine learning algorithms to predict admission to intensive care eventually, or the need for mechanical ventilation once you're in intensive care, or the probability of dying in hospital. And I won't take you through this in detail, except to say that we tried standard logistic regression, um, random forest, which is a well-known machine learning algorithm, and also XG boost, which is a gradient boost ensemble of decision trees, which turned out to be the best algorithm. Um, and we can predict um, the three outcomes, admissions to ICU, um, uh, possible mechanical ventilation, or the likelihood of dying in hospital, um, accurately enough to be of clinical use. We also had a look to see which were the main indicators of poor prognosis, and you will not be surprised to find, because it's now well known that age is at the top, uh, the amount of oxygen they were given, um, whether they're male or female, and then a whole host of other things, uh, including creatinine and other parameters. Um, we have um, uh, submitted this paper for publication. It's here if you want to read it and get more details. And um, as I say, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Lionel for that um, multifaceted uh, talk, which is very, very impressive. Um, we, uh, we have a question for you here Did, from Paula Grayson. Did your wearables dashboard monitoring effect show in a reduced number of infected clinicians at John Radcliffe? So it's very difficult to say that um, because of course there's no control um, experiments. Um, and it's very difficult to compare hospital to hospital. For example, what happened in, in Oxford, there was an intensive care unit for just COVID patients and another one for non-COVID patients. So we can't tell. Um, we know that there are very few fatalities of uh, hospital staff at the John Radcliffe Hospital, which is wonderful. We can't tell how much uh, part our system played, but we know that the nurses are extremely keen to have it now on the three isolation wards that there will be uh, to prepare for a possible second wave. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, just one more, one more quick question. Um, so what sort of um, battery life was the chest sensor and the wrist sensor? Right, so the wrist sensor um, 
it's important to note is uh, can be used on multiple patients. So you can disinfect it and use it on multiple patients. Um, the chest patch is only one um, use only. The chest patch uh, lasts between five or seven days. Um, minimum we ever got was five, maximum was seven. And the um, known in watch sensor uh, last two days before batteries have to be changed by the nursing staff. So in order to minimize the workload, uh, we make it quite easy for them to replace the batteries on either the chest patch or the uh, wrist-based sensor. Okay, well, thank you. As with all the talks, we have other questions as well, which we'll have to pass on uh, offline to you, Lionel. Uh, in the interest Absolutely. of time, of course, we'll have to move on to, uh, to, to the next talk. But thank you very much again.